Hello everyone and welcome to this new video series talking about the design of industrial warehouses brought to you by the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. Now this video series is a different one because this time you are going to have two video series moving in tandem. One video series is going to be explaining the theoretical background behind designing industrial warehouses and in tandem parallel to this there will be practical video series in Autodesk Robots trying to follow the things we discuss in theory. So it kind of pays off to double check both theoretical and practical in tandem to be able to get the full picture of the design of industrial warehouses. So sit back, relax and enjoy this new video series. Alright, so in this video series we are going to cover um, the design of industrial warehouses from A to Z basically and the material is being based on whatever is provided by the steelconstruction.info which is a free encyclopedia for UK, UK steel construction information. This means good news for anybody who deals with the Euro code because this reference is Euro code heavy. It has a bunch of PDFs that I will be referencing during my video series. Now, in this video series from A to Z, we're gonna cover cons architectural concepts, structural design concepts, loads, design of portal frames, trusses, built up columns, fire engineering, building envelope, and everything, basically from A to Z. So it's gonna be really juicy, and all of that only on the Civil Engineering Essentials channel. So if you haven't subscribed, hit that subscribe button, it helps a lot. Our reference here is going to be the design guide of single story buildings in Europe. So just Google that. It's free to be downloaded. It's, I think, an 11 part PDF file that is really good. And I have tried to choose something that is accurate and also has both theoretical and practical aspects. This is really good. Double check that and download that. It's free. So why not get a copy of that? So today in part one, we're going to talk about architectural concepts. And once again, the material is based on whatever I have from steelconstruction.info. Now today we're going to cover steel as construction material, typical profiles, why steel, systems, connection, cladding, and so on. So with that being said, let's dive into that. Steel as a material. Steel is made out of iron plus carbon to improve its uh, characteristics, plus any alloys to try to enhance properties. Now steel is basically fuel for arch architectural prowess, the idea of steel is, well, steel structure is like a synonym to modern architecture. The idea is that you have cool and unparalleled sculptural expression abilities because you can form it as much as you see fit. It has also a high strength to weight ratio and is always coming or most probably coming prefabricated, which means quality control, quick construction. It's basically Lego for engineers, but, and this is very important, it needs skilled workforce. So the people who are working on reinforced concrete might have a lesser skill uh, level requirement than the people who are working on steel structures. As a matter of fact, people who are welding steel structures in most, uh, in most countries need special licenses and certificates to do so. Please notice that since our channel is a civil engineering channel, you'll be skimming through most of those things as we are talking about architectural considerations. Now, uh, going on with this, you can see that steel structures give you the ability to do stuff that you cannot even do or think of doing in reinforced concrete unless you're doing some crazy complications. Also notice, I can see purlins here, I can see beams with curvature, I can see basically the entire package. Of course, these structures are also in big hangars like this. Of course, those are truck ports where trucks will provide goods to the, to basically deliver this. Also, even in uh, also even in cool construction that are landmarks like the exhibition halls and so on, steel structure is found there. Typical steel profiles are hot roll sections and cold form sections. Hot roll sections are done by heating up the steel and rolling them into shape as you see fit. Cold form section is basically forming the sections while the steel is not heated. And the idea being that, well, uh, for hot roll section, you can achieve higher thicknesses than what you can achieve in cold form sections. There is also cladding profiles. Those profiles are used to have slabs and sometimes walls for steel structures. And those are different, corrugated, trapezoidal, and so on. We've talked about uh, cladding profiles in a composite video, not just robot. 
I will link it above, take a look at that. One little note I have here is that I personally refer to hot rod sections as heavy duty sections. Basically, you will see those heavy duty sections whenever load paths converge. For example, beams and columns and main load carrying elements. Whereas cold foam sections are rather load rerouting elements with them converging into the heavy duty elements. So if you have a beam like this in steel and you have purlins perpendicular to the beam, with a corrugated sheet or cladding above it, you know that the cladding will give its load onto the purlin, which will transfer to the beam, and the cladding, uh, the panels here, or the purlins here, would be perfectly fine with cold foam sections. You can also still use hot roll sections, but it depends, of course. Now, here's a little video I have prepared for you, just to check out uh, how the rolling process happens. And this is taken from the YouTube channel, uh, Kuros BCSA Training. It kind of shows you the, the, the process of hot rolling, the idea being that those steel plates are being heated and passed through rollers, which try to which exert tremendous forces on the steel ingots, in the end, shaping it as one sees fit and requires. You can see them passing through multiple rollers multiple times until they finally get into the shape you want. I mean, take a look at this. This is, this is really amazing of how what we have reached in terms of technology. This process also being monitored in painstaking detail with sensors. Now, I know sometimes you are usually like used into me diving deep into new information and so on, but this is rather a little bit of less juicy information, but I need to give this and provide this lecture as introduction to future lectures because this is a full video course and I want anybody to be able to dive into this course and get used to it and, and get useful information from it. So why steel? Steel has low weight because of its high strength to weight ratio. Also, steel enables smaller dimensions because of its high strength and high elastic modulus, meaning that in all cases your deflection is small. For example, delta equals PL over AE or something over EI and so on. Usually, the elastic modulus is, well, a factor that is inversely proportional to deflection. Construction speed, hashtag Lego here. And of course, there is also flexibility and sustainability. And there is an entire PhD research topic talking about design for disassembly. This is somehow an architecture slash civil engineering PhD topic hybrid. If you are a fan of sustainability and green building then and want to do an MSc thesis or a PhD thesis on that topic, then just double check something called design for disassembly in which steel structures lend themselves very well for this kind of designing. And you can see, well, all kinds of crazy structures being constructed using steel structures. It's really good and really interesting. Of course, once again, the sustainability is also the ability to reuse scrapped steel back again into new steel because you can actually heat up steel, remove all the slag that will result from all the impurities and reuse it again. Recently, there, are, there is research of reusing reinforced concrete again, or at least concrete in that case, by crushing concrete and using it as aggregate. This is once again another thing that you might be interested in. Concrete is getting also sustainable and more green. And there are MSc and PhD theses talking about the usage of crushed concrete into the design of so-and-so and trying to see the adverse or the effects of using crushed old concrete as aggregate replacement replacing 10%, 20%, 50% of aggregates and seeing the um, effects on both fresh and hardened concrete um, characteristics. Now, structural systems, this is where things get interesting. Typically, architects come out of a basic idea of a layout and structural engineers try to make this happen by using frames, portal frames and trusses and so on. Now, there are quick rules of thumb uh, that might be interesting here. Uh, for example, if you have a pinned frame, a pinned frame means that there is no moment resistance. If you're using simple beams, your roof beam depth are limited to span over 30 and span over 40, with typical span ranges up to 20 meters. It's really good, and this is from the reference that is based on the Euro code in UK, so I and it's also a very solid reference, so I think that it should take this into consideration. Of course, trusses being the most OP of them all, spanning as much as 100 meters, portal frames being okayish, spanning between 15 to 45 meters. We are gonna focus on using portal frames 
because our video series and robot is going to be using portal frames. But those are options. Read them. It's really good. And you have a reference now to defend yourself against the suit. Because remember, when you choose a choice, it's not just I chose this because I just feel like it. Uh, I, mean, I mean, sometimes I say I feel like it in my videos in terms of uh, like joking. But in reality, usually when you have choices, those choices have consequences and should be uh, backed up by reasons whenever is possible. Because remember, if you are a junior engineer, you will report back to your senior engineer. If you are a senior engineer, then you're responsible in front of the project manager or the client for the cost that will incur in this project. So keep that in mind. Now let's talk about portal frames. There are multiple types of portal frames. We are going to be focusing on this, the portal frame in medium spans. It's also called the duo uh, sloped portal frame. And typical values here are six meters in height, or even it could be higher or smaller. Uh, the difference in height will affect the column design for buckling. You have typical spans of 25 by 40. The span perpendicular to the paper is basically limitless because you can um, put as much as you want portal frames in parallel to that. So the span perpendicular to the paper is not a big issue. The slope is usually six degrees to allow for water drainage and slope and, uh, and snow and so on. And this is basically a portal frame. You could have a curved portal frame here. You don't have an apex as you can see here, but you have basically a full arc that spans from start to end. And you also could have a simple portal frame with a crane. And when you have a crane, this will affect the clearance spaces because now you might need to add some extra vertical clearance for the crane equipment to move left and right. And you could have mezzanine floors where you have, for example, here offices or something, and here offices and stuff above it, and here the main area. And those offices need not to be extending for the full length of the, uh, for the warehouse or the industrial warehouse but those exist so you need extra height to accommodate those things you have also more exotic portal frames like two bay portal frames portal frames with integral offices actually two bay portal frames are not that exotic you will see them in airport hangars especially if the hangars are neighbors to each other but of course you have then the more exotic with a uh, integral offices on the side you have a mansard portal frame with three slopes it's kind of cool. You should take a look on those things. For portal frames, you have here straight rafters usually. Uh, by the way, I just I, I started throwing out some definitions like rafters and apex and eaves in the future. I will explain everything in a moment. But those beams here are called rafters. You usually have straight rafters. Those rafters could get thicker as you approach the column or not. It depends on your design. Usually they get thicker near the column by something called a haunch. And you could have Curved rafters is kind of less usual, where the entire beam is being designed to be curved. I will be focusing on straight rafters, basically. This is also a, 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 this is also possible, but straight rafters are more straightforward. So stabilization, which is my nightmare usually. This is the nightmare in Autodesk Robot. In stabilization, you need to stabilize two things. The first thing is you need to do structural stabilization or global stabilization. And the second thing you need to do is local stabilization. For global stabilization, you need to make sure that there is no distortions in the X, Y plane and no distortion. I mean, if this is X and this is Y, if we call this axis X, this axis Y and this axis Z, usually you need to stabilize your X, Y plane. And this is done by those bracings. You also need to stabilize your XZ plane, which is also done by this bracing, as you can see here. What about your YZ plane? Your YZ plane is stable due to the frame action of the portal frame. If this is a simple beam, then yes, you have to stabilize your YZ plane. This is global stabilization. What about local stabilization? This is element stabilization. An element has two flanges, an upper flange or an outside flange and an inside flange. The outside flange, as you will learn very soon, is assumed to be stabilized because the purlins apply the stabilization. The inside flange needs to be stabilized. And I had the idea of questioning if, um, if a beam is continuously braced or not. And we have the answer right now. It is continuously braced if you are stabilizing both lower and upper flange because this big beam 
is hardly stabilized only by this purlin on the top side. You also need to stabilize the bottom side. So keep that in mind. Talking about trusses, now this is a little bit elementary, so I will skim through that. You have multiple possible truss options here. Those are really OP. You can use them to cover large spans, and you can see them here. And well, there's nothing to be said here. Like normally, the truss is a beam replacement usually, and columns are steel. In the more extreme cases, when the column is too weak, you might consider having a truss replacement for the column. This happens if the column is very long and you are unable to stabilize it against buckling or it becomes uneconomical to do so. So you would replace it with trusses. Stabilization, once again, is a bloody nightmare for trusses, but it's the same thing. Stabilization is being provided by the purlins, and here you need to make sure of the connection of the purlin. The bracings we discussed just now, and continuous cords or claddings. A continuous cord means that the lower cord is usually one piece so that you don't need to stabilize each piece by itself, but you can stabilize the entire full cord. And claddings are also stabilization providers because they are, deal, they are considered a stressed skin. Those are cool definitions that you should Google or chat GPT right now or Skynet even. So just keep that in mind. If you talk about boring frames here, there is no frame action. It's just a simple beam. On a column, you have a release here, moment release, moment release here. This means all kinds of problems in stabilization. You need to be able to stabilize everything. And suddenly, you have to stabilize all planes. You have to stabilize the XY pla plane, which can you see, which you can see by this. You need to stabilize your XZ uh, plane, which you can see here, and your XY plane, your, your YZ plane, which you can use. So everything needs to be stabilized because there is no frame action. Now, fancy stuff, I will not talk about this, but keep in mind that those fancy cool warehouses do exist where you have cable and cable state things. I'm kind of surprised. I usually think that this is reserved for bridge bridges, but well, I think those exist, so those... Uh, are interesting. Arches also uh, are interesting. You could have a tie rod so, uh, connecting the supports, which will decrease the amount of horizontal reaction required here, or you could simply have no tie rod. In this case, the full horizontal reaction needs to be carried by the support. This structure, for example, seems to not have any tie rod, which means that the full horizontal reaction needs to be carried by those supports, which is kind of cool, but we're not talking about those things. Now for connections. When you connect to elements, you have usually two options. Option one is to have a rigid connection. Look, I have a very, I have a very simple classification for connections. If you see bolts going inside uh, the column, then this is most probably a rigid joint. If you see bolts not going inside the column, then this is most probably a pin connection. This is a pin connection, and this is a rigid connection. The idea of bolts going inside the column means that there is tension and compression being developed, which means there is moment resistance being developed. And that's a rigid connection. If you have bolts not going into the column, then there is no tension compression being developed, which means that there is some leeway for rotation. I know you would think, wait a minute, this cannot rotate much. This can only rotate around 3 degrees and then the plate will hit the plate. Well, 3 degrees is all you need to have a pin connection. Like, if you think that structures would rotate by 5 degrees or 10 degrees, this will never happen. Our structures usually rotate between like 1 degree to 2 degrees max. And this is also the case here. You see there are bolts going into the column, but there is a gap here, intentional, and the columns might not be um, like uh, tightly fitted or something. So it must be designed anyway. For me, I usually design my pin connections like this because those are the most clean pin connections. Our cladding systems here, well, there are three choices. Profile sheet cladding, precast concrete slabs, and block work. Now, the profile sheet cladding is the most common, which is basically some steel perforated sheet that can be single or double. Precast concrete slabs is kind of okay, I guess. It happens if you have, for example, mezzanine. So in this cool portal frame, if you have a mezzanine floor, then you might consider precast concrete slabs for this one that basically had to, to enable something to be constructed on top of it. And block work is usually for side walls only. Now for profile sheet cladding, you have composite panels, you have single panels, you have built up panels. Those will be detailed in the next video. So keep this in mind. The roof is usually also pitched. And the pitch of the roof is, well, 6 degrees, around 6 degrees, or 10% um, of slope. Secondary steel and roof. 
Well, you usually do this using cold foam profiles. You have Z profiles, sigma profiles, cool sigma profiles, and so on. And those are usually very thin because you cannot cold foam with large thicknesses because cold foaming with large thicknesses will cause cracks and that's why you hot roll large thicknesses. So those cold foam thickness profiles are used for secondary steel works. This is usually used for purlins, for example. When do you use purlins? You use purlins when the cladding is when the span of the cladding is too large, which is usually the case. Now, why do you use cold foam sections, not hot rolled? Because they are usually 30% lighter. I mean, duh, because the thickness is smaller. So no, no surprise here. Miscellaneous information. Now, fire safety uh, has requirements. Those requirements are categorized by the following possible categories. The first thing is the ability of a material to spread fire, which means basically the speed and level of danger. And the second category is the ability of material to produce smoke, which relates to the toxicity of a material. And then, of course, the ability of materials to resist fire itself, which is basically fire retarding. Now, please notice that single-story buildings have relaxed fire requirements. This is a big exclamation mark because I'm, each region has its own thing, so please double-check your regional codes and norms. But in my opinion and my exper experience, single-story buildings have relaxed fire requirements because it's easy to escape. So if you have a large, and if you have a large warehouse, maybe partitioning is needed so that you stop fire spreading. Um, I am, to be honest, I want to be frank, I am not a fire expert, but I know a thing or two of fire, like the fire triangle and so on, so it might be worth uh, reading. But of course, check out this reference for more details about fire safety. Another miscellaneous thing I want to cover is cranes. We had cranes, at least the idea, covered in one of our robot videos, I will link it above here. And you basically have a crane that has the ability to lift loads and to lift loads you have multiple things you have the lifting which is well the height of the the lifting of the crane you have the hoist drive which is basically the left and right movement of the crane and you have the crane drive which is the forward and backward movement of the crane you have also the motor drive and so on a lot of things that are here for us the point being is that this crane can move sideways and can move back and forth and this is our responsibility to design the structure for that thing. Uh, the design of the crane beam itself I don't think is part of my video series because usually you buy the crane fully with its system. I might think about explaining some parts of the system of the crane, how the specifications are in the future, like how do you select your crane. Maybe I will design and explain the specs in the future. This is stuff that consultants do, and maybe I will take a look at that later in my video series. For now, I will try to keep it as simple as possible. And that's everything I want to talk about in this video. For the architectural considerations, I hope that you enjoyed the video. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Especially subscribing, because it helps increase the reach of my channel. As per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel, and we'll catch you in the next video.